there's so much innovation and innovation needs to get in the hands of people who need them. It doesn't work if you can't get it to the hands of people who need them, right? And in, in the U.S., a, a way you do that is through the federal programs, through Medicare, because often that is a, Medicare is a leader in the industry for other uh, payers to follow. And so, you know, that's the kind of work that I do, get Medicare to accept an innovative device or service and help make it accessible to millions of people. And then hopefully others follow and it becomes a standard of care. And, you know, if those are the kinds of projects that I find are super fulfilling. Those are, you know, my day to day. We do strategy. Welcome to Public Health Careers. I'm your host, Omari Richards, founder of the Public Health Millennial. We're going to dive deep into public health topics and career journeys. You'll hear diverse career stories, absorb professional development and career strategies, get tips while also learning from others to help you in your own journey and learning of public health. Learn about the vast world of public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories. Stay tuned so we can do our part towards a culture of health, well-being, and equity for all. Hey friends, welcome to Public Health Careers. In today's episode, you'll hear more about the power of policy work and how this person was able to navigate from an internship position during her MPH to a health policy manager at the same organization working as a medical assistant and how that really taught how policies dictate healthcare and why she really wanted to get more involved in the policy landscape world, highlighting that you get what you put into grad school. So making sure that you take on the opportunities that are best aligned for you. If you enjoy this content, all I ask is you hit that subscribe button, leave a review and share this with someone who would get some value from it. This is really the best way to get the show out to more people and to show support. So be sure to subscribe, leave a review and share it with someone. I greatly, greatly appreciate that. Enjoy the show. Hey, this is Samaya Okiai McNutt. I'm a health policy expert and reimbursement consultant, and you're listening to Public Health Careers. Today, we have a health policy and reimbursement consultant. She conferred a bachelor in biological chemistry and bachelor in woman, gender, and sexuality at the University of Virginia. She then worked as a certified medical assistant before getting a master of public health at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health. She currently works as a health policy manager at Applied Policy. We have Samai Okiai McNutt, MPH. Welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to be here. Yeah, our pleasure is mine. Pleasure is mine. So before we hop into anything, like how do you identify and tell us um, a little bit about your personal background? Sure. Well, this is, I guess, pretty personal, but I'm a first generation um, Turkish American. So I did immigrate to the U.S. with my family when I was in sixth grade. Um, and English is my second language, but now obviously it's like a native language. Um and I grew up in the Fairfax, Virginia, DC, DMV area. Um, and I currently live in Colorado. Well, thank you for sharing that. And what was that transition like for you coming to the US, if you can remember, because you were six years old at the, at the time as well? Yeah, I, I was in sixth grade, so I was 11. Oh, sixth but, grade, sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. <laughs> but I remember a lot because of that. Um, and the transition, you know, it, it takes time and patience, but it was a little bit, you know, it's hard when you're a kid and you're leaving your friends and have to assimilate to a place where, and find new friends. And it took about like a year, really, um, a year and a half or so until I felt comfortable with. <laughs> Um, making friends and learning the language and everything. But overall, you know, I was a really good student. So uh, I worked hard and I, you know, I got my A's and got through and it was, it was, it was good. But it's, you know, outside of school and learning the language, the cultural transition, um, it's easier when you're a kid, right? Uh, my parents were older, obviously, in their 40s. Um, so it was a harder transition for them. But um, I, we just, they wanted us to have a better education. So here we are. Yeah, well, shout out to your family and shout out to, to all that you have been through and the experiences that you have. And I think it's just important to have 
people in public health and doing work that have a very intersectional background so that they can really advocate for all these communities and all these perspectives so we can have holistic and robust uh, policy work and just work in general. Absolutely. I love that. I love the way you said it. And who knew I'd be working in this when I came here as an 11 year old? No, absolutely. Absolutely. But we love to see it. As, as I always say, this is a public health uh, careers podcast, and we love to see people doing public health work. So talk more about the importance of health policy in the public health context. Yes. Yeah, so in a way, I think policy defines everything that everything within the con, you know, policy is public health, because everything that we can do, we're allowed to do and is within our reach comes from and ends with policy, in my opinion, and experience, because, um, you know, let's think about not just when I think policy, I don't just think politics, right? I think they're very different things. They are very different things. But um, policy can be, of course, influenced by politics or dictated by politics, but it's not always. It can also be influenced and dictated by advocacy and, you know, state and local programs. And a lot of that is hand in hand. So health policy is, I think, the, you know, really the intersection of making public health happen. Um, Because if our programs don't have um, money, <laughs> which comes from policies, or if they don't have whatever it takes to, you know, run their programs or make sure people have access to the drugs that they need and medicines, you know, there's some, everything is dictated by policy, no matter how much you want to help someone. And that I really re- learned that through my own experiences and, believed it to be true. I love the intersection of making public health happen and just how intertwined it is, as well as I like the point of highlighting that though we think of policy many times of like what politicians do, there's a huge part in there of like advocacy and being an advocate. And I think that's something that we as a society don't value enough or don't know enough about to create those advocacy capacity building like networks to to really advocate and say, hey, these are the things that we want and be be that political force in that way to have the policies that, that save the communities that we are in. So uh, I really, really like that uh, interpretation of policy and how it, how it works alongside public health. Yeah, you know, it's, I don't think you can make public health happen without changing policy. Like you can't get to your goals without changing policies. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. We de- we definitely need more people in public health or with public health backgrounds, continuing to do pop- policy work and ensuring that uh, the voices of community is at the center of, of that work so that we can get change and we can get systems and health improvement for everyone. So what does public health mean to you? Yeah, and I feel like that's such a uh, loaded question. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know how other people answer this, but I guess I'll give you like my journey to getting there um, a little bit. When I first embarked on the journey, I had no idea how wide reaching public health would be. It's everywhere and it's nothing at the same time because it's something that's usually operating in the background. Um, Unless you're in the space, you don't really see public health um, preventing epidemics, creating thriving communities, expanding access on the daily, because it is not the sort of thing that's in the morning headlines. You know, it's really was not until the COVID-19 pandemic that public health came to light um, for the general public. So, but those of us that know and are in it, public health is in everyday life, right? It's the reason some communities have access to healthcare services. It's the reason we can predict, uh, prepare and prevent epidemics, some more successfully than others. Um, It is advocating for people, for communities to thrive. It is addressing a problem no one else sees. It is changing policies to ensure insurance and regulations do not impede a population from managing their diseases or conditions more successfully. It's everything, right? 
public health is the kind of thing you don't really think about every day um, or almost ever, honestly, for most people. <laughs> but, but without it, I think everyone's lives would be hugely impacted. So um, it, it's a, I don't know, I guess that's a funny answer, but it's there and not there, but it's completely important and operating in the background. I feel that as one of the challenges of public health is like when it is successful, like nobody talks about it because nothing is really happening. And mm -hmm. we've struggled as a public health community to be able to communicate that impact when nothing is happening and showing the importance of that. But uh, that, I think everything you think, everything you said there is is very aligned with like how we need to continue to advocate for it and just thinking about it in so many ways to affect the, the populations that really need uh, better health or better access to health. Uh, so I appreciate you sharing that. Absolutely. I mean, I, I agree with you. I really don't think that, like I said in the headlines, it's not like, oh, today this like public health thing happened and, right. and all these people got you know, free transportation to the hospital or because of the works of these other people. Um, it's, you know, that's, you mostly see it when bad things happen. So when it, when it works, it's silent. When it doesn't work, you hear about it. <laughs> yeah, un unfortunately. And I think that that's one of the challenges that we have to continue to work uh, around and try to be able to communicate whether it's good or bad, just showing like where the value of public health is. And I think, as, as you said, like the pandemic has really shone a light on it. And I think people are paying attention more so. Maybe it's died down a little bit since since uh, mm -hmm. last year or so, but uh, definitely, definitely still very, very important. So you got your bachelor's in biological chemistry and women, gender, and sexuality at the University of Virginia. What was your thought process going into undergrad? So I always wanted to be a doctor growing up, you know, like, you get to be a doctor, a lawyer, or a teacher. <laughs> um, so I always wanted to be a doctor. I actually specifically wanted to go into pediatric oncology, which was, you know, pretty heavy. Um, I did do the pre-med route in college, um, but I was frustrated that wanting to become a doctor or work in science meant that I had to be stuck in the chem building for the four years that I went to college. And you know, I wasn't going to be happy with that. So I started to take some um, classes in the WGS department, which is woman, gender and sexuality. It was called something else back then and swag, actually, which was a really <laughs> funny name. <laughs> um, but it wasn't even a department when I back then um, in like 2011. And I think it was known as an intersectional study. Um, now I hear that it's a thriving program at UVA. Um, so I started taking those classes to get out of science and enjoy some fun classes that made me think differently, right? Like use a different part of my brain, uh, a little bit more creative. And um, UVA, the school just had so much to offer. And to this day, I wish I could go back and take some more fun classes, you know? Um, but I always maxed out on credits and like overloaded on them, <laughs> even in my last year. So taking more classes was not really an option. Um, so I, you know, I wanted to be pre-med. I wanted to pursue that, but I also wanted other experiences that the school had to give. Right. And I didn't want to just be like this science mind. So that's why I did the two majors. That, that makes a lot of sense. And looking back now, did you find value in that? Or how, how did you use the intersections of those topics to really grow your career? Yeah, I think there is a lot to say in um, women's health, like the intersection of policy and public health with women and women's health and women's empowerment. So I, even though I don't necessarily work in that field, I do love that I got to be uh, I got to be more educated on that and have the, you know, educational background to understand um, the complexities, right? So it's it's not necessarily, it do, and it doesn't have to be that they relate to each other, uh, like science and uh, women's studies and women, gender and sexuality studies, but it's, but it is, you know, I think that I think that degree is more like life relatable, <laughs> whereas my other degree is like more 
you know, science and technical um, and still relatable because I did work in, you know, as a clinic in the clinic. And um, I really love that part of my experience. Um, and maybe we'll go back to it one day. So the expansive nature of just taking different opportunities. And I think like that's important because many times we do keep ourselves in a box saying that we want to do this one thing. But like to your point, there's there is so much available at various universities. So why not take those opportunities up when you have the chance and and really just broaden your exposure and experiences and understanding of the world and the different ways that you can make uh, an impact. And talking more about I guess, women, gender, and sexuality. You were an intern, mentor, and group facilitator at Young Women Leaders Program. So tell us more about that experience. Yeah, so this was a community-based mentoring program, um, and that paired UVA undergrad women with middle school girls. And it was really good for me because it got me outside of the bubble that I felt I was in at school. And it was Charlottesville is a big community. And the program um, was one class and one hour. So there was a class component, but there was also one hour at the school um, that you were assigned to with your little sister. And, you know, you had a group setting, but you had your own little and there were a bunch of pairs. And that was every week. And there was a curriculum. um, And I really enjoyed it, you know. Starting the program was one of the big influences behind my pursuit of the second degree in WGS. So I think it really did have an impact on me to pursue something outside of science. And I, looking back, I really love that I did that. Um, And, you know, if you, I really hate that you get pigeonholed into a curriculum when you want to be in science or, you know, in um, pre-med, right? Because there's like so many classes you have to take to meet those requirements, but college should be about exploring some other things. It's the part of our lives where we need to expand our brains the most and learn about things we've never thought about before, right? So I wish there were more opportunities or maybe you have to be your own agent and create more opportunities for yourself to explore other things while you're in that period of your life, whether that's through classroom or outside of the classroom in the community. I'm absolutely an advocate for that because I think as, as we go into undergraduate, many times we, we have a vision for our life and, there's just so much more that the world has to offer that we might know about. And I think like, as you're saying, as we develop and take classes, they, we just learn more that there is more out there. I think that that's very, very important. And then talking, talking more about your experience in undergrad, did you have any big takeaways that you wanted to share with us? Yeah, I think this kind of, you know, t- uh, tags on to what I already said, but no matter, you know, who or what you think you want to be when you're done with school, Trust me, like there are so many more possibilities out there for you. I had no idea that job, like a job, what I do now existed when I was in college, you know, and I don't know if there's really a way you could until you get there yourself, you know, looking back, I guess I could have been maybe a public policy major and gotten to where I am today anyway, right? Um, but my interest in the intersection of and of health and policy came later from my personal experiences. So I didn't even know I was interested in policy <laughs> at the time I was going to school. So, you know, I think the bigger thing is that the takeaway is that no matter what you think you might want to be, maybe that's not what you're going to end up doing. And that's okay. As long as you find it fulfilling and enjoy it, <laughs> you know, but um, I think what, there's still a lot of, if you can pick pieces of your life and they contribute to the next iteration of yourself or what you do in life, that's all that really matters. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I, I feel just having a direction um, and many times that direction is like medical school or just focusing on health, soothing, positions and from there you kind of can be exposed to the world of public health and the world of policy and to your point I had no idea my position as a program officer existed when I was in my master's of public health program so just just saying like 
you never know what opportunities are out there and what opportunities are out there for you. So don't don't close doors that are are, are potentially going to be open for you and and just like try, try to be as expansive as you can about your career because yeah, as as Simai uh, just said, you know, she didn't know policy was a thing that that she could have done. So just just be open to the, all the different opportunities that that are out there. We have to acknowledge that we have a big advantage over other countries and educational systems when it comes to school here, uh, because I think we are, because we don't have to declare what we want to do until later on or, or what our major has to be, there isn't as much pressure to know what you want to be from the get go. And if you know, that's great. And if you don't know, that's also okay. And if you know, and you end up changing it, that's also okay. And there's opportunities like all along the way to explore different things. And I think if, you know, as an undergrad or like, I wish that was more encouraged or I hope it is encouraged that people get to explore different things. Cause you don't really know at 17, 18, that other, op- uh, like there might be something out there that's going to be super fulfilling to you. Um, but you, you haven't heard of it yet, you know, looking at the North American system, Canada and, and the USA, they, they both are very flexible in that undergraduate experience. And I want to say on average, just like people change their, their majors four times or something like that. I haven't looked up the stats in a while, but people change their majors. And I think that's important to know that you can change your major and there, there is just so much out there to continue to learn. So once again, don't, don't uh, cut your opportunities short. And after you graduated from your undergrad at, at UVA, you became a certified medical assistant at Clifton Care LLC. So talk more about that experience and how you came across it. When you're applying for med school, you try to set yourself apart from other applicants outside of your GPA and your MCAT scores. So hands-on experience is important to separate yourself from other candidates. So I research how I can get that experience. Um, So after I graduated, I signed up for a continued education program at the Northern Virginia Community College and got certified as a uh, uh, medical assistant, clinical medical assistant. And the program included an internship where they placed you in a clinic or a hospital in the community. And then I was paired with a urgent care called walk-in medical care. And the urgent care I interned at offered me a job within weeks of my internship. And I am to this day extremely grateful for the years that I spent working there because I got the kind of experiences I didn't really know that I would have an opportunity to get. So um, I did everything from patient intake to phlebotomy to taking x-rays to helping doctors with stitches. It was basically as hands-on as you can get. And when you work in an urgent care, you see the whole spectrum of patients, right? Since you, um, we also did administrative work. So I dealt with a lot of flustered patients, a lot of patients who didn't understand why their insurance would not cover a service, patients who cried, patients who yelled, patients who refused to take an ambulance to the hospital because of like, they were worried about the cost of it. There was just so much that dictated what we can do as healthcare providers by policy that we had no um, power over. So sometimes our hands were tied in spite of how much we wanted to help our patients. And I realized that as a provider, you can help one person at a time, but as a policymaker or enforcer, (laughs) really, you can help or hinder many people at once. So that's why I started looking into a master's degree in health policy. Was there any like one situation that made you say, okay, wow, I I really want to do something that really is expansive and really thinking about that policy aspect of, of this work? It was a... I I would say it was a culmination of experiences, not just one. Um, As I, you know, mentioned, there were often times, you know, we would have Medicare patients, for example, come in and they, Medicare doesn't cover everything that the, we could do, right. They wanted to do like a routine 
preventative service and Medicare only covers those like once a year. So we couldn't have bill it to their insurance unless they had a secondary insurance or if, even if we did bill it, it would get denied. So like knowing what services they needed, but then knowing what their insurance would cover or would not cover, you know, we had to make decisions on who we can help. And we also had Medicaid beneficiary and uh, who would come and we didn't take Medicaid. So we couldn't help them. And people would sometimes people would be super helpless, you know, um, we also had people without insurance who would come and want services. Sometimes the services would be too expensive and we try to work something out. So it was really a culmination of things. And sometimes a doctor would want to provide a service, but then the billing people would be like, well, we can't do that or it's not covered or something. And there would be a whole situation. So it just showed like how much of what we can do and can't do is dictated by the policies of insurance or, um, you know, outside factors. And that, that bothered me, you know, and I, it made me realize that like, no matter how much you want to help one life, you can make a lot more impact, a lot more change and impact more lives. If you got to change policies seeing the barriers in action, I think definitely could motivate you and inspire you to do more work in that policy realm. And I think that that's important. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad for your experiences there that really directed you into that, that path. And before we get more into your master's of public health, which you got at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health, you had a board position for two organizations. So you were associate board member for the Northern Virginia chapter of Girls on the Run International, as well as you were a board member at the UVA Club of Washington, DC. So talk more about maybe the process of getting into these positions and then like, what did you do or learn in, in those positions? Absolutely. So those two positions were very dear to me. And if I could, I would still do them to this day. Um, I do other things now, but uh, I did move away from the area, so it's hard to stay a member um, when you don't live there. But the one of the things that I care and I feel that I'm very passionate about is giving back to community. And the way I do it personally is through volunteer work um, and committing time and energy into a couple of organizations um, I'm a proponent of, you know, spending time years really in one or two organizations versus doing like a lot of little um, volunteer projects, which they're all important and all good for me. This is what works. What This is what I feel like you can put the work in and see the fruits of your labor later on. Um, so that's what has mattered for me. So for um, the Girls on the Run associate board member position, I was actually, I was in a sorority at UVA and our philanthropy partner was Girls on the Run. So I, that's how I learned about them. After college, I saw an opportunity to be involved in the local chapter and I leaped at it really. Um, I have always loved being involved in the community and mentoring and empowering girls is one of my passions. As we talked about, I was involved in that in school as well. So um, I was a coach for Girls on the Run in a local elementary school for several seasons. And that what would happen is you work all semester uh, with the girls for them to be able to uh, compete at a big 5K at the end of the season. Um, on the outside, Girls on the Run is an after school running program, but it was really much more than that. It's a mentorship program empowering young girls through the tool of running, right? Um, so one of my roles as part of this board was to also be a liaison between the sorority chapter at the local university, George Mason University. Um, I later became a chapter advisor for that um, sorority chapter. And that was another volunteer position. It's a position I still have today, but it's at a different capacity. Um, so woman's empowerment has been a running, running theme in my volunteer work. And, you know, much of that comes from my, you know, degree that I pursued, uh, the second degree I pursued at UVA. 
And how about the experience at the UVA club? Oh, yes. Yeah. So that is also very dear to my heart. I loved my collegiate experience at UVA. I wanted to make sure I stayed involved after graduation. And I immediately signed up for local alumni um, chapter after graduation. And I started going to some of the events. Um, the UVA Club of DC is one of the biggest, one of the most active uh, chapters that the clubs that they have and obviously it's the closest metropolitan area to where the school is located um, so it has a lot of members in a big operation um, there was a monthly book club that I loved going to and when the chair stepped down I stepped up to the position and this made me a part of the board um, once I was part of the board, I got to be involved in more and more with the club. And like I said, if I still lived in the DC area today, I have no doubt that I would still be doing it. Um, that book club has been running for like something crazy, like 20 years. Um, and it was really a delight to be a part of a community that had, you know, people from every generation participating and in, in it, putting like minds together and, um, I found it so fulfilling, you know, getting one of the ways that can help you grow as a person, especially as a young person, is putting yourself in maybe sometimes uncomfortable positions and talking about talking to people who are from different backgrounds, different jobs and learning from them. So I found it so fulfilling. Yeah, that, that's amazing. And I appreciate you sharing that you wanted to get involved and, and stay involved in your community. And this was the way that you saw that you can get involved as well as I feel like building experience and, and connections to people and the community that you work in or live in, um, which which is awesome. And it was also the threat of, I guess, like women empowerment. So like young, young women empowerment, which I think uh, kind of just shines through, through you from your undergrad experience as well. So, so I appreciate you sharing that. And yeah, that's awesome that you were able to get engaged in board member positions as someone coming out of their undergrad, undergraduate degree. And I think more people should should try to actively engage in that. I think, you know, where the opportunity lies there is being willing to put in the time, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can't go to something once or twice and expect to be a board member, you know, two months from then. Maybe it will happen, but that's why, you know, I've been involved in things for long periods of time because it takes work and it takes time to really, you know, A, earn people's trust, but B, to make yourself um, a part of an organization. And, you know, as someone who's young, having those experiences, I think they can be very solidifying to you as who you want to be as a person. You spoke about your interest in getting involved in policy from doing your medical assistant position. Yeah. How did you decide to to choose like a master's of public health in, in health policy? Because I know you can also go the route of like a master's in public policy. So like totally. what was yeah. that was that part of your thought process and like why did you decide to do the MPH in health policy? You know, I have to be honest, I didn't think about public policy at all. <laughs> I don't know why. I totally could have. Like I um some of my coworkers in the past have were went to GW for the public policy school and, you know, work with me. So and that I think would have I, I didn't know that there was a health policy kind of route in the public policy school as well. Mm -hmm. But I really did want the healthcare portion to stick with me, right? That's what my background is. I wanted, I wanted to be in healthcare. Um, I don't know if I still will practice being a clinician in the future. You know? So it's, it's all the possibilities are out there. And um, I do believe that we can evolve, we can do different things, we don't have to be locked into the same job, or niche or position for a long time and we are always evolving right and you know i think i love the idea of being an expert in something and continuing to build up on that but i think you can always add new experiences so that's why i that's i wanted to bring my like healthcare experience with me like the provider side of it and that's why i picked public health policy through the public health program um and i you know i learned so much in the in grad school of things that I 
didn't even know I was going to learn. So, you know, I'm really grateful that I chose to go that pathway. Absolutely. And and I feel like there would be no wrong path if you if you were to do the the public policy with the health concentration or whatever that's that's um weighted. I, I feel like you would have been able to do very similar things. Mm-hmm. And but like to your point, you knew that you wanted to stay on the health track as well as do policy work. So the MPH makes sense. And was there any bigger decision or like what what was the, the thought process around getting the masters of public health at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health? So there are three reasons, like big reasons why I chose um, GW for the Milken Institute School of Public Health. Um, One was location, because as I mentioned, I was in the DC area. Um, And the second thing was flexibility and having a hybrid program, because I wanted to work full time slash I needed to work full time because girl needs money and <laughs> to be financially stable, we, we need that. Right. So I, I had a condition that I needed to go to school and work full time at the same, you know, together simultaneously. So that was important to me because UW had a hybrid program, uh, for the public health uh, program. And they also accepted my MCAT scores, which was awesome. I didn't have to take the GREs um, to get in. And so I was like, amazing, thank you. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, So that was also another reason, but they, the hybrid program there, I did had online classes, which are class, you know, you have class times and live instruction, and then also uh, instruction offline that you had like homework you had to do, but it was still like a classroom just over Zoom, like we had to do during pandemic. And then um, you could also choose classes that were on campus and go to class on campus as it worked with your schedule. So I really liked that flexibility. And the last thing is that, you know, I think it's a, you know, prestige, I think plays a role in it, but it's the reason why I think GW has its prestige is because of the staff that they have. The professors that work there are people who have done like wrote the ACA, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like they have done some crazy, amazing things. And they've worked for because of the proximity of GW to the nation's capital. Obviously, a lot of the professors have Hill experience. They are seen as experts and brought in for hearings, you know, they have done a lot of really cool things. So to get to be like shoulder to shoulder with professors who have all this experience, I think was a very special reason to pick GW. And having the reasons behind choosing a school, I think is so important too. So thank you for sharing that. And definitely GW is one of the schools that is up there. If you're thinking about doing policy work, like I would definitely advocate for, for thinking about GW and putting that on your list. So, yeah. And yeah, you're G- welcome, GW. <laughs> <laughs> Free advertisement, right? Right. <laughs> right, right. Um, so during your MBH program, you were a policy research and communications intern at Applied Policy, which is the organization that you work for currently. But we will get to that in a bit. So tell us about that that internship that that you had. How did you get it? What did you do in it? Yeah, so it was it was pretty interesting because I started looking for a job in the field pretty soon after starting the MPH program, and I couldn't uh, work at the urgent care any longer because you know we had like twelve to fifteen hour shifts, and I couldn't really do class with those shifts, so I did have to you know quit that. And then I was really ready for a new experience, so I was just like I spent a, some time looking for jobs, and I wanted to go to school and do a job that was, you know, in the same field. Um, and that's not, you know, you, you have to be kind of lucky to do that or you have to look for a while and it's not going to happen right away. And, you know, because I didn't have the degree yet, I was just in school. I, it was, I was trying to find w- innovative ways to work in the field. So I found this opportunity for an administrative position at Applied Policy and it was a job posting I found on um, my alumni network at UVA. So that's a hot tip to use your career services that your university has for alumni. 
um, you know, you, you can always use that as a resource because people are going looking for people who went to their schools and that's a point of easy connection in my opinion. Um, but so same with that, I found this position that a UVA alum had posted. She worked at Applied Policy and I thought the position or the company was great and it seemed aligned with what I was going to school for. So even though the position was an administrative position, I still reached, I was like, oh, maybe I can like put my foot in the door and learn while I'm going to school, you know? So I applied for it. It did take a several, several follow-ups. I also like reached out to her via LinkedIn, I think. But I finally got an interview and like spoke to um, a couple of people there. And then I had um, another a couple other follow ups. This was like over the time of several months. And then um, I was offered an internship instead of the admin job. I was not expecting it at all because that was not like a listing that I saw. But because of my, you know, experience and because I was going to the MPH program, they offered me a internship that they weren't necessarily looking to fill, but they felt I was right for it. Um, and, you know, that's the story of something like professional p persistence paying off and not knowing, you know, you never know where the opportunities are going to come from because I definitely thought this was going to be a place where I just like, could do something that wasn't really the job, but I could learn while I was going to school and it ended up being like a whole other amazing experience. So I think it's important that, that you highlighted that you were persistent, that it didn't happen just like that. It was something that you saw a position for. It wasn't even the internship and, and you applied for it and then you just were persistent around, around it, reaching back out to them and finding the person on LinkedIn and reaching out to them. Because I think so many times we are scared to kind of ask for what we want. But I think, especially as a student, you have the permission to be annoying and to email <laughs> people and to follow back up because you, as, as you say, you're like, you never know what will happen. And you were thinking that you'll just do this administrative position and just be in proximity to the work and in showing up and advocating for yourself, you're able to get this internship that would, I would imagine would be a lot more valuable to you than, than the administrative position. So just people out there be persistent and follow back up with people because you never know what will happen. And that's amazing. And from this, I think you you got promoted into a health policy associate during your MPH as well. So tell us about that process of like going from internship into a position. Yeah, not only did I force myself in there, but I stayed <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> so, and I'm still there, as you mentioned. So um, how that happened is, so my internship was originally for three months, but that was uh, extended to six months. And then I was offered a full-time associate position. Well, the internship was full-time too, but the full-time associate position um, within six months. So I was still in the MPH program. So it was, you know, I had to ha have a little bit of flexibility to do class um, around the work schedule, but I, you know, I, it was doable just because also the classes were the hybrid flexibility that I had that that really is what made it possible to work full time as an associate and go to school because um, I would have class like I would schedule the late ones like right after work from five to seven. <laughs> so there were a couple occasions where I did like they were very flexible with me and I was able to leave work a little bit early so I can get to campus for the class. But um, I was able to do remote classes too. So it, that was really nice about the, the program and working full time. And I know a lot of people who go into public health are doing a career transition and, or will have to still work. And I totally understand, you know, like I, I was doing both and that's why I picked a program that was flexible and had hybrid options. Yeah, amazing. Um, okay, sorry, your original question, though, <laughs> um, with the, you know, becoming promoted, being promoted to an associate, 
you know, it was really wonderful because I got to work in exactly what I was going to school for. And oftentimes I, I think it's like a miracle when you get to use your education for the work that you do and your work that you do for the education that you're getting. Um, it shouldn't be a miracle, but, <laughs> but it kind of is when they like line up so well together. Um, so I, you know, looking this job that I didn't even know would be that ended up being that. So again, opportunities can come from anywhere. And were there any other masters of public health takeaways that you wanted to share? Yeah, I, you know, kind of on the same note, you get what you put in to it, right? Like from your experiences, I think in grad school, especially in a hybrid situation where you have online classes, it's harder to build relationships with classmates and professors. So you have to put in that effort to get to know them, maybe meet them, trust that they may be important later on in life to you. Um, because everyone in this field is potentially looking to be a professional in public health or health policy for me. So it's, I think MPA, like any grad school is kind of like a big networking event <laughs> and you can just go meet people you need to go for, you need to put yourself out there. And as I mentioned, you know, at many of the schools have staff that's, they're just phenomenal sources of information and if, if you don't go up and utilize them or talk to them, you might not know what opportunities they might have to offer you or ideas to give you or jobs that they do that you never knew existed. And I think that's something that's very untapped that people underutilize, um, both on the side of like using the peers and the people that are in your program to just network and to build relationships and to understand all the expansive work that is public health, as well as leading on the resources that are already there in the form of professors and, and other um, resources that universities have so that you can really because, you know, as, as you said, you never know what opportunities people have and, and just really being able to approach someone and share like what you want, what you're thinking about could be what is there for them to share an opportunity that kind of aligns with, with what you're thinking and getting an internship or getting a, a job from that. So definitely, definitely utilize the connections that are already there and the professors and other people that are around you, because that, that's an important part of the journey. Agreed. Yeah. And then after you graduated, you continued on in applied policy and you became a senior health policy associate. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that shift. Yeah. So that was, I want to say a year or two into the associate position. Um, I had a pretty quick acceleration, I would say, um, at applied policy. And that was because of the opportunities that were provided to me um, during that time. I learned a lot really fast and got to do a lot of things that um, a lot of many associates might not get to do in other positions. I will say apply policies, you know, less than um, 30 people working there. So it's a more of a boutique firm. And when you work for, I think working for a smaller company can be scary sometimes to a lot of people and they might choose to work for like big cor corporations. And, you know, you can do what I do working for a bigger firm. And um, what the downside of that is a lot of the work you do as a, at the junior level, you don't get to be presenting to clients or talking to them face to face. It's your senior people doing that. Whereas at my company, we've, I was given a lot of opportunities as an associate, as an associate and senior associate to talk, you know, do that, have that role to establish myself at, with the clients as an expert. So, you know, obviously it takes time and trust building to do that, but it is an advantage that smaller companies can provide in this field to help you grow uh, and learn um, and also put yourself out there as an expert in something. 
And at the same time, I feel like you have to be willing and ready to take on those opportunities to really uh, grow into those positions and as well as like do a good job in it. So reflect, reflecting on it, like what, what are the things that you, you have done to like really position yourself to get those opportunities and to, to um, take advantage of them? That's a, you know, really good point. Of course, they don't just come to you. Like you're given them if people think you're capable and that's why you get more opportunities once you're successful at something. And for me, you know, as I think it really clicked for me when I was doing my master's program and work and like think I, I was using what I was learning at work to help my homework, <laughs> like to help, you know, what I was doing in school. And I was like, so I felt ahead in school because of what my job was, which is crazy, I think. Um, and, you know, that that feeling, I think, gave me a lot more confidence. And also, um, just being able to being open to taking opportunities that are given to you and at first, and looking into it, like not letting it scare you if you don't know what something is, right? If you're given a project or you raise your hand every time something comes up because you want to volunteer, you want to learn, you want to be proactive, that those are the things that catch the attention of your superiors, right? So I would, you know, it does take confidence. I can't lie. Like it does take that. And sometimes it's going to come for some people, it's going to come faster than for others. And that's okay. Like people have their own own pace at learning and growing in these kinds of roles um one of the big components of this and as you know i um i later got promoted to manager which is my role now and one of the i have like kind of two jobs it's not just being an expert in health policy and my area, but it's also being an expert <laughs> in consulting because I'm a consultant and, you know, it, that's an art of its own. So you're not all, as a young person, that's an art that takes some time learning um, and doing. And one of the biggest recommendations I have for people who want to go into consulting is to be yourself, but also watch the people around you and how they handle situations and, you know, make note of those and learn about reading people. Reading people is so important, reading the room and understanding what reactions of your clients may be to something. <laughs> That's like the magic of consulting, right? So it's not just public health or health policy or like knowing you can know everything you need to know. But as a consultant in my job, it, you have to be able to deliver it in an appropriate way, right? You have to be able to manage people at the same time. Absolutely. And I, I like how you dive into like, yes, you you became an expert in like the health topic that you're focused on, but then it's also how do you cultivate the consultant skills to to really become a manager and someone that can lead this work and, and do all the interpersonal things that uh, we, we don't think about, but are still very, very important, especially in a consulting type of role. Um, so what, what types of organizations do you all consult and, and work around and what is your health expertise in? Well, great question. I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, so our clients can be anywhere from they're in different verticals. So we have diagnostics, medical technology, devices, durable medical equipment, um, drug pharmaceuticals and services. So services can mean hospitals, associations, um, you know, that's not all of it, but that's kind of like the big umbrellas of our verticals and the types of um, clients we work with, they could be manufacturers, they could be a society representing other manufacturers or societies or uh, providers or other groups of people. Um, they could be a hospital system or a health system. Um, they could be a supplier of medical equipment. You know, it's, it's, it's an array of things. And my expertise is in 
um, specifically med tech and devices. So I managed a portfolio of clients in that uh, vertical. And so my expertise is specifically in that arena of policy. Um, And, you know, specifically we do federal um, work, so regulations, so Medicaid, Medicare, specifically uh, coding reimbursement and coverage of of items and services. So um, one of the, an example I can give you that will help you and the listeners understand the type of how I think policy, the work I do impacts people's lives, which is why I'm doing this to begin with. Um, We were, for on behalf of a client, we went to a, how do I put this, a federal agency um, and got a coverage policy for a uh, diabetes technology expanded to allow more people to use it and get it, get it covered by Medicare so that um, all of more like a huge chunk of the population after all of our work doing that was able to now access access that technology, which helps them manage uh, and their diabetes and that, which is a chronic condition. And, you know, it can get very expensive paying for something out of pocket when your insurance doesn't. And a lot of this population, they have other socioeconomic reasons for why they can't afford it without insurance, right? And so part of us, our motivations on helping this client get this expansion of coverage, yes, you know, they want their product to get out to more people they're probably going to increase volume and make more money from that. But it's also so and there's so much innovation and innovation needs to get in the hands of people who need them. It doesn't work if you can't get it to the hands of people who need them. Right. And in, in the U.S., a, a way you do that is through the federal programs, through Medicare, um, because often that is a Medicare is a leader in the industry for other uh, payers to follow. And so, you know, that's the kind of work that I do, get Medicare to accept an innovative device or service and help make it accessible to millions of people. And then hopefully others follow and it becomes a standard of care. Um, And, you know, those are the kinds of projects that I find are super fulfilling. Those are, you know, my day to day, we do strategy on how to, you know, get from point A to B. And, um, you know, I think in the corporate world, it's more called like market access could be another word for it. Um, But I like, we like to think about it from the perspective of improving lives is what we're doing, no matter the goals of the client is what we're doing, improving lives at the end. And if the answer is yes, then it's fulfilling, right? Yeah. And Quick question. So you, you said you're an expert in med tech. How, how did you develop that knowledge? And before you answer that, yes, everything you said there is, is awesome. And I think we continually need people to push Medicare, Medicaid to do more innovative things to, to really try to improve because they have such a large swath of the population that they serve. And as you said, they are the leader in a lot of this. So it's like, how do we get that innovation to them? And then the innovation kind of moves across to, to other providers. So how, how did you develop expertise in med tech specifically? So it really just happened over time because of the um, clients and the space I was put in. So when I started as an intern and then continued as an associate, they uh, the company put me into where they needed the most help, right? And uh, that was in devices and medical innovative medical technologies and i that's what i started working on from the beginning so you know medicare and a lot of medicaids too they have regulations and there's like statues dictating those um regulations and you have to become well versed in them to be able to say you're an expert in them but also you have to know how to move the levers to make it work for different um, 
clients or potential new technologies to get them through that to the finish line to people to where they need to go to. And, you know, I, that it really happened over time. And it's a tough question because I don't think you can develop that expertise by like reading something, you know, by like going to school for something. Um, And that's what's hard about that's the more complicated part of this job. It is niche in the sense like health policies niche, but then the expert being an expert in like a piece of health policies, even more niche. And I think that's just something that has to come with time and experience. And being a health policy manager, what do you like most about your job? So I I think I already touched on this, but the projects we work on are truly so fulfilling. Every job has, you know, the parts that might be mundane, you know, (laughs) that maybe you just have to do, but they're there comes along, you know, that one project or two that really make you feel like you're making a difference in the world and the lives of people and the lives of average Americans. And that's what makes it so fulfilling, right? And I do take pride in the fact that my company does takes on projects like that more often than than most, I, I would say, or maybe we're su- we have a good success rate. I don't know, but I've I've felt, um, you know, very fortunate to be a part of uh, a number of projects that we've had that have been able to go from A to B from the beginning to improving lives of uh, average people by getting them a technology that they didn't have access to before, you know, we worked on it. Um, And the other component is, you know, it takes a village. It's not just me or my company working on something like this. Obviously, as a consultant, it is at the request of clients and what their vision is and working with them. Um, But also a lot of it, advocacy is a big part of it. Um, And we have to, you know, sometimes we are part of coalitions. Sometimes we have to work with other organizations and, you know, come up with ways to advocate for this thing to happen for the betterment of providers and beneficiaries uh, and, and patients. So, you know, it's, it's not just one person like does the change. It takes a lot. And of course, you work with the government, too. Um, they're, they're a piece of the puzzle. And just to make a correction, you are making impact. So just, just <laughs> you, know, you don't have to think about it. You are for sure making impact. So I appreciate you sharing that. Absolutely. And then before I move you on to the Furious Five, I would like to ask, where can people connect with you, Samai, as, where, as well as where would you like to see yourself in the future? So you can find me on LinkedIn. Just type my name, Samaya Okay McNett. <laughs> um, I think it shows up pretty. I don't think there are a lot of Samayas <laughs> out there, at least in the US. But <laughs> um, but yes, LinkedIn uh, is great. And then, of course, on the company website, you can find my information as well. Um, for where I see myself in the future, gosh, it's a loaded question. <laughs> Um, I have been exactly where I wanted to be for a long time. And, you know, it's been really wonderful and fulfilling. So thinking about what I might want to do in the future, like I am not necessarily there yet. But I think that we have to always be curious about, you know, what, what we could do about opportunities that might come up that we never thought about, you know, as I circling back to the very beginning of this conversation. So it, 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 it's not that I'm not open to, you know, what, like learning about or thinking about what I might want to do in the future. Um, it's that I'm, you know, I, I'm curious about opportunities and I don't, I don't know what's next, but I, you know, I enjoy, because I enjoy what I do so much, I want to stay in something that's, I think it's so important to be in something that's fulfilling, you know, 
Um, that's where my heart is at. So as long as I think more about the part of like, okay, am I doing something that helps people at the end of the day? Um, and if the answer is yes, then there's opportunity there. Love it. Love it. And moving on to the furious five, the five questions I ask all guests. And this will actually be the first time that I'm asking a new question for number five, because number five used to be where can people connect with you? But we're going to put that further up. So you're the first one Whoa. to answer this <laughs> new furious five. Hot spot. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? So I think there are just more opportunities than you can ever imagine in this field. Um, as I mentioned earlier, public health is everywhere. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Ask your you know, professors about their experiences. Go to office hours to discuss opportunities. You know, I had a I had a policy class where my professor invited leaders in the field to come speak to us. And I remember learning so much from a session with a staff member from Senate Finance Committee and a staff member from House Energy and Commerce Committee. And they were totally open to students reaching out to them and like grabbing coffee and picking their brains. Like I knew I didn't want to work on the Hill at, you know, at that time, but I thought it was so cool that they were, you know, giving out their phone numbers <laughs> and um, all that to say, like opportunities are, are around you. You have to, but you have to look for them and you have to put yourself out there a little bit. Number two, if you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? So if you're new to health policy, there are a lot of opportunities that start at internship level. As I mentioned, like I started as an intern, I didn't even think that's what I was going for. <laughs> and, um, you know, so don't skip out on those. It's a pretty niche job what I do. So chances are you're not going to have the skills you need right out of grad school, you will need to develop those skills. And a great way to do that. Um, I mean, and it could be rather quickly is through an internship. And um, we discussed earlier, but in consulting, you're not only mastering one craft, but two. So you're not just an expert in the subject matter, but also in the art of consulting. So, um, and if you want to do what I do, it comes with two things. <laughs> Appreciate that. And number three, what's something you're working on improving in your life right now? So I think I'm still kind of coming out from this pandemic era feels that I, <laughs> that I had. Um, I did become fully remote um, when I when pandemic happened and then I moved across the country. Thankfully, I was able to keep my job and you know being remote doesn't hinder me from doing my job effectively. And so I, I am lucky in, in that way, but I think it does like put uh, me, um, it, it's like the pandemic as with everyone put me in kind of a, a funk. So I am in the move as well. So I'm coming out of that and want to become more involved in my community again, just like I was when I lived in uh, DC area. So um, you know, I, I have held an advising mentoring position um, for the last five years that I've had kept going through the pandemic. But I mentioned the two roles I, you know, gave up when I moved here. So I do want to find something um, else that's I'm passionate about that gives back to the community, probably related to women's empowerment <laughs> or girls empowerment. So that's the one area of my life that I definitely want to work on uh, next or now. Number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? So I do have one thing, and I think this is more for like life perspective, not really for health policy in general, but I do recommend the book, um, The Good Life by Dr. Robert Waldinger and Dr. Mark Schultz. Um, for me, so the book is based on a decades-long Harvard study of adult development. Uh, I think the study has offshoots elsewhere now, but it's also known as the longest scientific study of happiness. And for me, you know, 
It's all about living a fulfilling, happy life. I don't know how many times I said the word fulfill during this podcast. So, <laughs> you know, as you can imagine, it matters to me. So I, you know, this book was about this, you know, is about this big, long uh, longitudinal study. And it's proving that what makes happy, healthy life uh happy, healthy, and fulfilling life is good relationships. And, you know, at the end of the day, if that's relationships with your partner, your colleagues, your, you know, neighbors, all of that, you know, the people in your life and those relationships that you build are what, you know, make the the core of a good, good life. And I do truly believe that I that's why I think I'm so like, I have the, I've been involved in the community, I have a high desire to do things in the community and work and have a job that improves lives. Um, so for me, that was a pretty prominent uh, read. Yeah, and it's interesting you said that because I recently listened to a podcast interview with uh, Robert Waldinger um, on on a, the Diary of a CEO, and I'll link it in the show notes for anyone that's interested. But yeah, that that is the exact like key takeaway. You know, like having good strong relationships are just so important. And um, I think I think that is something that is like so simple that we can integrate into our lives that we should like focus on advocating for in public health to create better, more whole lives. Uh, so I appreciate you sharing that. I'll yeah. definitely like link the book and that podcast episode. Awesome. And then. Last but not least, and this is this is the uh, the first time this question is going to be asked on the podcast. So here it goes. Um, if there was one piece of advice you'd give to your younger self, what would it be? So loaded <laughs> question. <laughs> I feel a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, I think if I am only able to give one piece of advice, it would just be that to focus on being yourself and relate, you know, building those relationships to people around you, you know, it's life is about the relationships that you have and job is important. And, <laughs> you know, education, all of that is important. But when you look back in your life, you know, I think the people, the legacy that you leave and the people who remember you are the people that knew you, right. That you had relationships with and you can, and that relationship could be anything. It could be work. It could be love. It could be family, you know? Um, so I think always, I, this is kind of how I've always been. So I don't know if it's like advice, <laughs> but, but, you know, relationships are number one and, um, just be yourself no matter, you know, don't compromise who you are for other people. Love it. Love it. Can, can, uh, get a better first answer to this question. So I appreciate you sharing that. So my, <laughs> I think, um, I, I appreciate the <laughs> being put on the, put in the spotlight, but, um, just one last thing, if you don't mind as a, a woman in the industry, I think, you know, I would say public health is probably dominated by women, I could be wrong, but there's still not a lot of women in as many leadership positions as there should be, in my opinion. So, you know, we being a professional, a young professional, a young woman uh, who's a professional, you do have to advocate for yourself and speak up when, you know, and don't take no for an answer sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, if you're a young professional or student now looking to go into this field, I would say like, that's a piece of advice to take with you. And I appreciate those ending remarks because yeah, it absolutely is, is important. So I appreciate you sharing that. And I appreciate you coming on and sharing all your insights and your story up to now. Uh, it's been very, very entertaining for myself as well as informative. So uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Amari. I really appreciate that part opportunity to be here. The pleasure, the pleasure truly is mine. So housekeeping items, everyone. Thank you all so much for watching and listening to this. Be sure to subscribe if you have not as yet. Be sure to leave a like, leave a review, and share it with a friend. Create the Greatly Helps Show, get out to more people, and help more people understand what they can do in public health. So be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend. Appreciate you all. Peace.